when he rose up from the dead Welcome. Happy Easter to all of you. It's good to be together with you here and those of you joining us online as well. I don't know if any of you were here for the uh, Tannenbrae service on Friday night, but as you left, you left in darkness. It was this uh, powerful uh, but somber experience of remembering Jesus' death on the cross. And you left in darkness and in silence, and today we get to come together in lights the beauty of uh, creation around us, and we get to celebrate together the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As I read the resurrection story this uh, week, I was kind of just fascinated by the, the character of Mary Magdalene, uh, just not, not somebody that I had reflected on as I had read that story in the past. And if you don't know Mary, Mary's story, early on in Jesus' ministry, he healed her uh, as she was a demon-possessed woman. And uh, Jesus cast uh, the demons out of her. And from then on, she, she wanted to follow Jesus. And so that took her uh, on the day of Jesus' death on the cross. Uh, Mary was there uh, watching as Jesus died. As uh, Joseph took Jesus' body to bury him, it actually no notes Mary and one other Mary that were there as Jesus was being buried in the tomb. And sure enough, on the morning of the resurrection, who should show up but Mary Magdalene once again. She just kept following Jesus. Wherever Jesus was, she wanted to be. And so we have this, this story, the setting, where this angel comes uh, to, the, to the tomb uh, as Jesus is resurrected. And it's, it's this magnificent event where there's so much power in the angel and in the resurrection that the, the, the earth quakes um, this angel is this angel of light, and, and these soldiers that are guarding the tomb, these you know, big, brave soldiers, part of the most powerful uh, army in, in the known world, they faint in fear. And in the middle of this big, magnificent, magnificent event, this angel looks at Mary and says to Mary, fear not. It just kind of caught my attention that in the middle of this thing that cut time in half, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, that he, the angel there, looked at Mary and said, in your fear, I see you. And as we come together to worship, we're, we're remembering together as a body this big monumental event, and yet in this moment, I want you to hear that wherever you're at, the fear, the anxiety, the sadness, whatever you walk in the door with, Jesus is looking at you and sees you and says, fear not, I am with you. So I invite you to stand together as we uh, read the call of worship together today, and let's celebrate together, and also uh, just bask in the fact that God sees us in our story. From Matthew 28, I'll begin reading. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was, cru who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Our God and Father, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. You have not forgotten the needy. You have remained the hope of the poor. You have raised your son from the dead and he, as he was unable to be held by its power. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, hallelujah. Jesus, you have risen from the grave and you are now seated at the Father's right hand. Therefore, our hearts are glad and our whole beings rejoice for you will not abandon us, but by your resurrection, you have overcome death on our behalf. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You were the stone that the builders rejected, and you have become the cornerstone. You are our God and our rock, our fortress and our shield. You are the horn of our salvation and worthy to be praised, for your grave remains empty and you are enthroned forever. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Amen. So we know where Mary Magdalene was during the resurrection story, but where was everyone else? Where were the men who Jesus had poured his life into for over three years? Men that Jesus had loved and sacrificed for. 
Where did they go? At the first sign of fear, it was every man for himself. They were out of there. They were hiding. Even in this moment, as Mary walks up to the tomb, where were the disciples? They were hiding out in fear in the upper room. Don't the disciples drive you crazy? Don't they get it? They drive me crazy, too, until I remember, oh, yeah, that's me. That's my story. The first sign of fear, the first sign of things not going as I had planned, and it's every man for himself. I don't have to look back too far. Last evening, I was a mess talking to my wife about this problem and that problem. The world is coming to an end. Unlike Mary, who just kept going to Jesus, I'm all about taking care of myself. If you can relate, I invite you to read this prayer of confession together with me as we confess the weakness of our faith and the faithfulness of a rescuing Savior. Let's read this together. Jesus, you have overcome death. You have defeated the grave, and you promised to be with us always. But even today, on Easter Sunday, we struggle to live in light of that truth. When facing suffering, we often forget that you are near, and when life gets hard, we often forget your power. We believe the truth of your resurrection, but our faith often grows weak beneath the pressures of daily life and the sin and death we experience all around us. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us for forgetting what the resurrection means. Forgive us for losing sight of the fact that we are united to Christ. His righteousness is now our righteousness, and his victory, our victory. Because of him, death will never have the last word over us, and therefore we have reason to hope and rejoice. Holy Spirit, would you renew our faith this morning? Strengthen our faith in Jesus, our Savior, who has rescued us from death to life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing.
And our hope is not in the quality of our faith. The hope, our hope is not in us being faithful disciples. Our hope is not us going after him. Our hope is entirely in him coming after us and rescuing us and giving us eternal hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And with that hope and with that confidence, I invite you to read the assurance of pardon together with me from John 5. Let's read together. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. The children are dismissed as we continue to sing.
good to worship together with you. You may be seated. Let's have our congregational prayer. The Apostle Paul proclaims, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Join me in prayer. God, your love is steadfast and endures forever. You alone are good and your promises are true. We were dead in our sin and by your grace you have made us alive in Christ so that through him we are no longer condemned. We are no longer orphans, but we are sons and daughters. By your spirit we cry, Abba, Father. Thank you for leading us out of darkness and into your light. Where there was despair, there is now hope. Where there was division, there is now reconciliation. And where there was brokenness, there is now wholeness, all through the work of Christ's death and resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And in light of your love and your mercy, in light of the new life that we have in you, and in light of your kingdom, which we are part of, and declare to this world, help us to show the same love and mercy that Christ has shown in us. With that, Lord, we want to lift up our adoption community group. We pray for this group as they faithfully minister and support the adoptive families through monthly prayer meetings. We pray that they would have strong connection and fellowship through these summer months and pray that the ice cream socials they have would be a place of encouragement and joy. And Lord, this group is is, uh, working on a one-day conference uh, for adoptive parenting. I pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom, discernment, and unity as they plan. Let this event uh, be one that brings much fruit and equipping to your people. Lord, we also want to thank you for the respite nights that have gone on throughout this year. They've been a blessing to families and to our volunteers in the church. Lord, we pray that you would be with this community group as they seek to offer respite weekends through the organization of Mother's Rest. We pray that families would be able to participate in this and that they would be renewed. Lord, we want to lift up families today as they gather in the name of Jesus and celebrate his resurrection. We pray that as we gather today, relationships would be renewed and pointed to Jesus as his spirit leads. And Lord, we pray that you would bring reconciliation today where there needs to be reconciliation. We also recognize that even in the joy of this holiday, um, we still walk in this fallen world until you come again. And so Lord, we pray for those who have recently lost loved ones and those who are facing health and other challenges. Lord, we pray that the hope of Christ would fill their hearts today. For the church, we pray for this church. We pray for our regional care communities who will soon be gathering uh, in our five different regions. Lord, please use these regional care communities to draw us deeper into community with one another. Let there be sweet and meaningful relationships formed in your spirit. And finally, Lord, we pray for our brother Anthony. Be with him as he preaches us, to us from your word. Lord, please open our hearts and minds today. Let us not just hear the gospel this morning, but let us be changed by it. If there's anyone here today who doesn't know the gospel, please give them ears to hear. Let them bring their sin and brokenness before you this morning and know the victory that you have given us over these things. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Dave, and good morning. We're going to do this again. Ready? He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Happy Easter. Uh, It is good to be with you. My name is Anthony Gamage. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life, where we exist to know Jesus and to make him known. And I want to welcome all of you, but particularly want to welcome those of you who are new. Uh, Maybe you snuck in with family. And and I just want to invite you, if you're from around here and uh, you're trying to just find a church home and are looking around, we'd love to know that you're with us today. Uh, we'd love to know how we can get in touch with you so we can uh, you know, answer any questions you have and share with you more uh, of what New Life has to offer here as we look to uh, know Jesus and make him known. You can let us know that you're here by downloading the app. Uh, and There's a form on there where you can fill that out. Also, there's a half sheet on your way in. If you didn't receive it, you can grab it on your way out. There's a little QR code on that you can scan or you can head over to newlifedresser.org slash this week. Uh, also, there's folks with these orange, lan- orange lanyards. Uh, they'd be happy to answer any questions that you have as well. But welcome. So glad you are with us here this morning. Well, friends, uh, let me just ask you this question as we get going today. Uh, What stories do you tell? What stories do you tell? And maybe I can frame it this way. You're 
likely getting ready to go hang out with friends or family uh, around a lunch or dinner table, or maybe you were there here uh, just in the last couple of days, and, and maybe I'll ask, hey, what are the types of stories you told? Now, I come from a family of storytellers. We, for generations, really, uh, there are stories of sitting around the table. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, all the cousins would sit around and just listen to the aunts and uncles and grandparents sit around the table and tell stories. We would laugh till we cry. We would cry, uh, right? There was just a a whole host of stories that were told. Here's some of the highlight reel. Uh, There is one uh, in particular where um, my mom and her cousin went to the doctor, uh, their, uh, my mom's brother, my uncle, drove them and said, hey, sit in the car, the keys are here, you know, to keep the AC going or whatever that may be, don't drive the car, okay? And what happens when sometimes you tell people not to do something, you do it anyway. So I think my mom was then, you know, 14-ish, Uh, And so they got in and they're like, hey, we can drive this big old station wagon. And so uh, here they are going back and forth and driving. And guess what they end up doing? They hit a light pole. And guess what the light pole did? Crushed the car behind it. Like right, it was like one of those cartoons, like right in the middle of it, sandwiched it. And so they put this whole plot together of here's what we're going to say. And my uncle comes out. And they're just like, you would never believe this drunk driver came through. And he hit the light pole and it fell. Boom, it was amazing. And he was like... I was getting my back worked on, and I saw the whole thing through the window. You're a bunch of liars, right? Happy Easter, Mom, if you're watching. You're welcome. Um, so, uh, so, so, you know, that's one story. There uh, were other stories. Here's another story that our family likes to tell. Uh, it's of the discovery of my night terrors. Uh, so, um, you know, at one time, it was a summer, or a summer, no, it was winter. We were being trained for campus ministry. Uh, and, my, and my soon, not soon to be, but my future wife was in the room. We weren't dating yet. We barely knew each other. But I was telling the story about, you know, when my roommate in college discovered my night terrors, how uh, I thought a groundhog had jumped underneath the covers of my bed. I grabbed my nine iron. And I started beating my bed. Remember, wasn't married at this point. Nobody was hurt uh, in, in the filming of this night terror. And so uh, anyway, uh, what's hilarious about this whole story is my wife, as she heard me tell the story, turned to the woman next to her and said, his poor wife, <laughs> right? Gotcha, right? You didn't, know that was, you didn't know that was coming, did you, right? There are other stories that we tell about my uh, great-grandmother, 100 pounds, soaking wet, right, grabbing a cast iron skillet and whacking someone over the back of the head. We laughed at that story. I'm not sure we should have uh, when that was told. Or the stories of my grandfather after he had passed of storming Uh, the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, and the list could go on and on and on of the stories we tell. But but maybe I ask this question, why do we tell stories? Why do we tell them? Why do we sit around the table and and tell stories as friends and as families? And And I would just say this, stories draw us together. They remind us of a shared history or memory or life together. You know, as we listen carefully to our stories, our stories reveal dignity, right? They were made in God's image. And so we hear that reflected in some of our stories. It also reflects on our brokenness and our sin, right? Some of us can't get those stories out of our head. We keep them on loop. You're a failure. You're shameful, right? Sometimes we tell stories to process our grief and our loss, the pain of living in a fallen world. You know, not too long ago, I was sitting around the dinner table, and I was telling the story of how the Lord saved me and rescued me at the age of 19 to my kids, and just reliving the Lord's redemption in my own life. And here's what I would just articulate, is that if we listen carefully to our stories, they reveal something. They reveal our worldview, how we view the world, how we process life, where we find our hope, what we think is our enemy. We listen carefully. Well, this morning I'm going to tell the resurrection story, but it's not going to come out of just one simple gospel. In fact, I'm going to preach the whole Bible in one sermon. (laughs) Yeah, pray for me. Pray that this actually uh, happens in a timely fashion. Um, but, But I want us to just take a look at this book and say, hey, if we were to squeeze this, what's the drop that would come out? And so I just want to start at Genesis and go all the way to the book of Revelation and tell the story of the resurrection as scripture tells it. So here's the picture that's going to govern our time. Some of you have seen this before. It's hanging uh, upstairs. It's a painting by David Arms uh, about God's story. Uh, He's an artist from, uh, I think it's the Franklin, Tennessee 
area. And so the way he puts the four major movements of the story of Scripture that we're all caught up in, uh, he labels it life, loss, love, and then life. Uh, The four words that we would use, or maybe you've heard used around here, is creation, fall, redemption, and then finally consummation. And and I don't know if you pay attention to this, but every week you may come in and you go, hey, every time I come to New Life, the the liturgy, or I would call the order of our worship services, it, it just feels pretty much the same every week. And you're right. And that's actually very intentional. It's, it's following the arc of the story of Scripture, right? We begin with some form of song that, that reminds us that we're created for God, and then we move to a time of confession, and then we're reminded by our assurance of pardon uh, the new life that we're offered in Jesus Christ. And so that's where we're headed here today. I'm going to pray for us as we get going here this morning. So if you would, please pray with me. Well, Lord... Um, We come to you today out of many different places. Many of us, our hearts are warmed towards this story of the resurrection and drawn to it, and Lord, we're rejoicing in it today. Lord, for some of us, it marks a point of pain or of grief. For others, we just kind of don't care. We're here because we've been drugged by a spouse or a parent or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Some of us are here out of duty, and some of us just are sitting here going, "Are, are you there Lord, I don't know where my friends are coming from this morning. I know my heart has been a mixture of all sorts of things this week. But we pray that you will cause our hearts to settle and to listen. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would open our eyes to the great truth of the gospel as we see it in the resurrection. And so Holy Spirit, would you guide my words? Would you protect our hearts from the evil one who would love to snatch up any seed of the gospel and rip it away? And Lord, would you just open our eyes to who you are today? We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, so the outline is this, all right? And we're going to start with the first point in this picture of creation. And so if you're like, Anthony, you're preaching on the whole Bible, what, what verse do you want me to open to? Genesis 1, that's a good spot. We're going to spend a lot of time in Genesis here at the beginning. But, but here's creation, right? So we're going to jump around, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to end here in 31. But here's what it says. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, and God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Probably familiar to many of us, yet we often just assume we know all that's going on here and what it means for us. But let me just slow down on this for just a minute and give you three things that that these few verses mean. And you know, in between this, you have the first day, second day, so on and so forth. But but here's the three things I want you to just wrestle with as we look at this first idea of creation. The first is that you are a part of the creator's story. You're a part of it, whether you want to be or not. You are a part of of the creator's story. He spoke everything out of nothing, and it is his story to write. Hamlet is a part of Shakespeare's story. Frodo is a part of Tolkien's story, and you and I are a part of God's story. Now, here's the second thing I want you to wrestle with, is God's story is a good one. What does it say about his creation, at least before Genesis 3? It said it was very good. Not it was mediocre, it was meh, like it was very good, right? I want you to think about it. You know, some of us right now, it is spring. And and for those of us who love warm weather and beauty and color, like, it it is so welcome. You know, if you go to Longwood Gardens, you walk around right now, and you see the tulips and and, and daffodils just exploding and the colors and the the blooms on the trees. How many of you have just stopped in the last week and gone, oh, it's here. This is so beautiful. Finally, winter's over, right? Why do you think you do that? because you're marveling at God's good creation. Many of us went on vacation last week. We went to mountains or we went to to beaches. When we go there, you know, what do we do? We sit there and we just look out over the ocean. We look at the mountains and, and we marvel. Why? Because God's creation is good. What about human beings? Has any of you marveled at another human being recently? Like, not weirdly or anything, but like, like, think about it. When, when Sandy Run Middle school was being built over here, and somebody knew where to put the pipes that came out of the 
ground to put a toilet. I'm like, that is amazing. Like, I can barely tie my shoes. How did they know the toilet's going to go there, right? I mean, that's a big deal if you get that wrong, right? Or last night, there were millions of people all over the United States and really world sitting in front of a television watching NBA playoff basketball. Why? Those are amazing human beings. They can do things that I can't even dream of doing. Why do we marvel? Because it's God's good creation. He created man and woman in his image. Very good. It was very good. How about this one? The relationships that we see happening just in Genesis 1 and 2, where it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, and so he created Eve, and he's like, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, woohoo, right? And there it is, this beautiful relationship. And friends, lest we think that God is this cosmic curmudgeon, it's in there that he created, in his good design, sex. It's enjoyable. Praise God, right? Do we miss that in his goodness there? What about work? Now, I know y'all might have had a bad Friday or something like that, but but did you know work is a pre-fall thing? In in chapter 1, he tells them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over it. That's work. That happened before the fall. Have you ever stopped after cutting the lawn and gone, That's amazing. Look at that. I feel so satisfied right now. Or after a big project or whatnot at work, you're just satisfied. That's that's because God created work, at least in its pre-fall context, and it was good. Here's a third point. This story is about God's glory, right? Nobody looks at Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night and it's like, ah, oh, that, that painting, it just painted itself in an amazing way. Look at how that star did its little thing up there, right? What happens when we look at artists' work? We marvel at the artist. Van Gogh's other paintings are amazing too. It draws our hearts and our minds to go, look at the glory of this artist. And so friends, maybe I just say that because sometimes we think this story is about us. And it's just not. God is still good in it. He loves you in the midst of it. But the story is about him. And the story is about his glory. And whether or not we trust in him and believe by faith in Jesus, he will receive glory regardless. He will receive glory if we receive his grace that's freely offered. Or if if we really um, continue to go down the path that we by nature desire to go and stiff arming him and rejecting him, he will still be glorified in us. Rocks will cry out if we don't. Friends, we're all telling a creation story. We're all telling a story of what we believe we've been made for. What story are you telling? Are we telling the stories of I'm made for freedom or autonomy or sexuality or prosperity or relationship? Is is that our creation story? Because that's a worldview. Are we telling the story of I've been created to glorify God in his good creation? Here's the second part we're going to look at is fall. All right, so we're back to our painting. This is loss, right? And I I love the fact that the colors change. There's ravens. There's no leaves on the tree. I think sometimes when we look at the artwork of, of the fall, it's like, you know, Adam and Eve, they have some, you know, strategically placed fig leaves, but nothing else has changed, right? It's all green and, and wonderful. And, and, and I think it, it probably feels a little bit more like this. Probably a little bit more Alfred Hitchcock or Jordan Peele movie than uh, just kind of a couple fig leaves and still lots of green. It was an utterly terrible moment. Not the way that it should be. Up until now, work was fulfilling. Relationship was easy. You could eat tomatoes and not have acid reflux up to (laughs) this point in the story, right? But then Genesis 3 happens. Here it is. And to Adam, he said, and by the way, you know this story, right? There's, there's fruit in the garden. There's a tree that God said, don't eat of that fruit. The serpent enters. He tempts Eve. She eats. She gives it to Adam. And this is where sin comes in. It says, and to Adam, God said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I've commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Not just him, but the ground. And in pain you shall eat of it all of the days of your life. Thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you and shall eat of the plants of the field. 
By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Friends, have you ever wondered why in our heart of hearts we sometimes want to shake our fists at God? Have you ever wondered why sometimes you feel ashamed before God and before others? Well, in chapter 3, verse 7, we see shame enter. We see Adam and Eve hiding from God where they used to walk with Him in in, in the cool of the evening. The fall is why you feel shame. Have you ever wondered why pregnancy, having children, raising children, even having adult children is really hard? In verse 16, it says this, this will be difficult now as a result of the fall. You ever wonder why marriage is hard, married couples? It's never hard, is it? It's a piece of cake. Easy, pretty simple. No, not at all. That's a big lie, single people. It's wonderful, but it's hard. You know why? In verse 16, it says, hey, there is this tension now that will exist in the marriage relationships. You ever wonder why we fear things like mosquitoes because they'll give us Zika virus or things like that? It's because the ground is now cursed as a result of this moment. You ever wonder why when you start digging a hole or something in your backyard and your shovel breaks, you're working on a major project and all the data from your computer gets erased? Well, it's a result of this. Thorns and thistles will infect the ground, affect the ground. It's hilarious. Over the pandemic, people are like, I'm going to leave my job. I'm going to be more fulfilled. I'm going to start this thing. And two years later, there's all these polls that are now showing that like 60% of people regret shifting jobs. Do you know Why? because they got on the other side of that job and said, oh, the curse is still real. (laughs) It's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging, this side of eternity. Friends, do you wonder why every single person in this room is going to one day face death and return to dust? It's because of the curse. It's because of the fall. It's fascinating to me this week as I was sitting here and getting updates from our friend John Eide in Ukraine and feeling his agony and pain, and I thought to myself, isn't it fascinating that we're in the place we're in as a world right now? Because we often build this idea that, hey, sociologically, we're, we're advancing, uh, we're not going backwards, yet, yet after World War II, somehow a man like Vladimir Putin has risen to power, his polls in his own country are skyrocketing, and other nations are aligning with him. What is wrong with us? Haven't we outgrown, haven't we advanced culturally? It's because of this. It's because of the fall. Until Jesus returns, there will always be another tyrant. It might be in Russia, or it might be in our own homes. God, help us. The reason it's important to figure this out is because it changes how we approach it. I'm not saying we work, we don't work for justice. In fact, I think this is the fuel that moves us in this direction, but it also convinces us that there is a greater enemy than flesh and blood. What is your fall story? I had a friend who was going to work outside or in the community center in which uh, we live across from, and, and she was in high school, and I was like, hey, how's the job? And, and she said, you know, it's, it's good, but it's weird. You know Why? Because all they do, the other people I work with, is complain. Like, all day they complain about their husbands, or their wives, or their kids, or their in-laws, or their bunions, or something. But they're just constantly complaining. And she's like, why is that? She legitimately said, why is that? And you know, when I stopped and I thought about it, I was like, well, it's because they're trying to make sense of their false stories. They're telling the story of who their enemy they think is. So what's your false story? Is it the false story of Scripture? Or does it reflect a different worldview? All right, here's the third one, redemption. Redemption. And let me ask this question. Why do you think Marvel does so well? You ever stop to think, why does Marvel do so well? And why do their horror movies, right, that they make not do as well as the Avenger movies, right? Why? Well, well I think it's because, at least in part, they figured out that we all need heroes. There are these echoes of Eden going on in our hearts where we yearn for creational goodness, but we know that there is an enemy that has upended all of this, and we know we are desperate for a hero. 
I missed a verse. This is an important verse. Can I go backwards for just a second? I'm not going to go backwards. Anyway, (laughs) Genesis 3.15. I'm sorry, Tom. I did it to you two services in a row. We try. Here's Genesis 3.15. Here's what God's Word says. In the midst of this fall, in the midst of this enemy, we see this. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In the darkest moment, God did not abandon his creation. He's talking to the serpent and he says, serpent, guess what? Um, My rescue mission has begun. I'm going to send a great, great grandchild of this woman and he, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head and offer the death blow. This is Good Friday and Easter in one verse. Did you know that? Do you know that Jesus' death on the cross was the bruising of this Savior's heel? But this thumping of the head, if you will, was the resurrection, which is the beginning of the final death of this serpent for all time. All right. So I'm going to go back here to this picture. Here's what I love about what arms did. You see those two ravens? One's looking at the carnage, but the other one is looking forward is looking towards hope. And in this next picture of love, we see that hope. It's that little cross in the middle. You see that egg. That's this picture of of new life that's to come. You see the butterflies. It's the picture of metamorphosis here. And so the rescue has begun. Now, I know some of you are sitting here going, honey, didn't he say he's preaching through the whole Bible, yet we're at the end of the service almost, and we're still in Genesis 3? We've got a ham in the oven, right? I know. (laughs) So I'm going to kick it into a little bit of a different gear, and I'm going to move us pretty quickly through uh, the rest of the book of Genesis. Are you ready? You ready? All right, just, just hang on. I'm going to be quick here. Genesis 3, right after that, we have the first murder, Cain and Abel, all right? But then after that, there is another son that comes along, and his name is Seth. And so, and so that bloodline doesn't go away. His work of redemption continues, but sin continues to spread. Genesis 6, 5, it's one of the worst verses in the Bible. It says, wickedness was great on the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Oh, and right after that, do you know what story comes next? One pastor was talking about this this week, and I found it hilarious. It's the story of the flood, right? The one where like, hey, little Sammy, little Susie, it's time to go to bed. Noah got in his little boat with a couple of little animals, and it was wonderful. And then God wiped out all the rest of the world. (laughs) Sleep well. (laughs) Night, night. It'll be great, right? But that's that story. And then after that, what happened? You have the Tower of Babel. God's people immediately go right back to saying, we're going to try to de-God God. We're going to build this tower. We're going to be just as good as him. And you know what God did? He confused their languages. And in my opinion, the way I look at it is this is a picture of, of the beginning of the nations, of this dispersion of different languages and whatnot that, that came from that. And then what happens right after that? So you've got Noah, you've got Shem, uh, his son, and then from him comes this guy named Abraham, right after Babel. Here's where God takes us in this story of redemption. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And listen to this. In you all the families of the earth, that would be the nations, will be blessed. Hang on to that terminology, because we're going to hear it a lot more as we rifle through the rest of of this story. But, but God said, Abraham, I'm going to take you, I'm going to make you a people, and then this blessing that I started with in Genesis 3, it's going to come, he's going to come from you. All right, the rest of Genesis, here's what happens. Abraham has a kid, it's Isaac, then Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel, the nation of Israel. Then you've got his son Joseph. Joseph gets thrown into captivity, goes into Egypt. Israel comes to Egypt. Egypt acts as this little incubator where God's people explode in population. But then Pharaoh begins to oppress them, uh, and and then what ends up happening is God raises up a deliverer by the name of Moses. So here, uh, I'm going to call this the stairway to Jesus, not the stairway to heaven. That's different. (laughs) But but this is kind of the the steps that happen from this point to Jesus, to this deliverer, to this person who will crush the snake's head. You have Moses, who shows up on the scene here, who uh, is the functional, physical deliverer, 
of God's people. He gives them the law. But even in this giving of the law, Deuteronomy 4, 6 says, hey, guess what? The nations are going to see you, my people, keeping God's good law, and they're going to marvel at it and say how wonderful a God is who these people serve. It goes on, and you see in the wisdom books, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, it's the practical outworking of this law and the lives of his people. You see the history books right after Moses and his first five books. Joshua takes over, leads them into the promised land. The job's not quite done. And in the book of Judges, we see God's people entering into this cycle that we still see today, honestly, that they're a mess. They keep giving themselves over to the oppression of everything but God, crying out for deliverance. God's merciful and gives it to them. But it happens over and over and over again. Finally, he gives them uh, the king that they were yearning for, at least in part, in David, in the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. And that's this next part of the layer cake, where uh, God says to David, hey, you are my king now, but you know what? There's always going to be a king who sits on your throne. The true king is going to come from you. And that's pointing to Jesus. From then, you get Kings and Chronicles, which really chronicles these kings that come after David that are a mess themselves and, and lead God's people full on into captivity. The prophets come during that time and they say, hey, God's people, you're living outside of God's story. You're not, you're not following him. You're not living into this blessing that he's called you to. And they warn them and they warn them. Ultimately, they're thrown into captivity. That's what we're studying right now. And David's saying, even in the midst of that, I'm not leaving you. And there's still hope. The people get released from captivity. They kind of rebuild the temple, but it's not the way that it should be. And then the Old Testament kind of ends with a thud with uh, the prophet Malachi. Malachi, it really goes radio silent for a few hundred years. But even in Malachi, here's what he says. From the rising of the sun to its setting, God says, my name will be great among the nations. His plan's not over. Enter the New Testament. First four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are gospels. Those are, those are books that are written to chronicle Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death and resurrection. You've got the book of Acts. That's the beginning of the church. That's where you see this chick, these chicken apostles who are scared to death. Now all of a sudden turn into uh, those who the Lord uses to begin his church. And then the rest of the New Testament are essentially letters written by, by the apostles to these churches, encouraging them and telling them, here's how you apply Jesus Christ to your current context. All right, that's it. We're done. Bible. We're finished. There's a little bit more. These letters that I just mentioned, that the Apostle Paul and several other people write to the churches, they really turn on one idea, and Paul captures it well in 1 Corinthians 15. This is where we're going to double-click and kind of wrap up this section. Here's, here's what Paul says. For I delivered you, and he's writing to a church. It would be like Paul writing us a letter here in Dresher. He says, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also receive. So he's saying, this is the most important thing, church, that you are to never graduate from. Here's what it is. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, right? There's Good Friday. And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. For as by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. That verse that I skipped earlier from Romans chapter 5 said, said guess what? When, when Adam sins, we're all engrafted into that. We all become rebels against God, his enemy. But what this is saying is his death on the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection undoes that. And now in the resurrection, there's life. This morning I was reading from this one man who was recounting how he lost a friend in Iraq when they were uh, on that tour together. And as he was reflecting on this all these years later, he quotes C.S. Lewis as he talks about the significance of the resurrection. Let me see if I can find it here. Here's what he says. C.S. Lewis says, The New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole history of the universe. He is the first fruits, the pioneer of life. He has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. Friends, in the moment of the resurrection, everything changed. Jesus is more than Iron Man. 
Iron Man didn't come back from the dead. Jesus did. If you ever wonder how on earth these frightened disciples became the people who Jesus Christ built the church on, it's the resurrection. They saw it. They saw him beat death. Friends, in a hopeless place right now that our world feels, this is our hope. It's the reason that our brothers and sisters sitting in Ukraine right now can still have hope in the resurrection just as much as we can today. Because in Christ, there is the hope and promise of new life. The resurrection is the reason that this symbol went from being a simple electric chair, because that's what it is, to something of of glory, to the promise of new life. We're all looking for a savior in our stories, aren't we? Aren't you looking for a hero? Aren't you? Now, it may be different than Jesus, but you're looking for something to put an end to your suffering and that will return the world to the way that you think it should be. Every single one of us. What is that area for you? You know, if it's things like autonomy or control, we are going to look ever so hard at going, okay, that next job, that thing that's going to give me financial freedom, or that next political candidate, they're going to fix it. I don't know how we haven't figured out that every two to four years, (laughs) it didn't work, right? But man, we are willing to go to blows with each other for it, aren't we? It's because we think they're our saviors. We think they're going to put it right. Or that relationship, right? Don't those become functional saviors? Well, friends, no matter what we are tempted to put our hope in, I can promise you they're going to fall short in one of three categories. They're either not going to be able to love us back, that candidate, that job, never be able to do that. They won't be able to die for us, right? Or if somehow they could meet those first two criteria, they will never be able to raise from the dead. Only Jesus can do that. Friends, what's your hero? Who's your hero? And I know you're like, well, I'm a Christian. It's Jesus, of course, Anthony. Come on, let's be real. I know my heart begins to think, oh no, this will make me happy. This will satisfy me. And so this Easter, it's really worth wrestling. Is my hero able to raise from the dead? How do you make this story your own? How how do we make the story? Maybe maybe this story isn't ours. We're still in it. We can't change it. We're a part of it. But but how do we own this story and live into it? Well, Paul writes this to the church in Galatia. He says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Think about that for a second. It's those of faith who are sons of Abraham. So if we have faith that we are who God's Word says we are, broken, woeful rebels against God, and we also believe that Jesus is who He is, Savior and Lord, then all of a sudden we become a part of that blessing that we read all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. Now listen to what, what else he says. This is fascinating. He says, The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall the nations be blessed. Have you ever stopped to think that that Genesis 12 passage was the preaching of the gospel to Abraham? Whenever you read that passage, you're reading the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what this is saying. That's the commentary this gives us on Genesis 12. It says, So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So friends, I would just say, if you're here going, what what is all of this about? It's actually pretty simple. God is calling us to live into that blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ by simply having faith and believing we are who Scripture says we are, and Jesus is who Scripture says He is, our Lord and resurrected Savior. Here's a final point, and I will be brief, but it's this picture of the consummation. Some people would say it's restoration, Uh, But I don't think that goes far enough because we're not just simply restoring Eden, right? Because remember, a snake got into Eden, didn't he? You know, this consummation, this last panel, uh, there will be no, somebody, a biology guy, uh, uh, corrected me on this last time. There will be no snakes 
in this garden? And he said, yes, there will. It just won't be Satan. And he was right. I think there'll be snakes. I know some of y'all are like, I don't like snakes. There won't be any snakes. You believe what you will. There probably will be, though. But there'll be nice snakes. Okay. <laughs> but I love his pictures. The birds aren't just these kind of uh, singular-looking house sparrows, right? They're different colors. They're vibrant. It's not just one piece of fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit that is, that is multiplied. And the tree is bigger and more beautiful. And, and friends, that is where Jesus is taking us, to something far better than even the Eden we long to get back to. Can I just read to you the end of the story from the last two chapters of the book of Revelation? He, Jesus, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He goes on in the next chapter to say, This is what this new city is going to look like on earth. It says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the streets of the city. Also on the other side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's that blessing. The thread has gone all the way through to the last verse. And it started with a tree. In the middle there was a tree, cross, and it ends with a tree. It's the blessing of the nations. That's the resurrection story. Without the empty tomb, this story doesn't happen because nobody's conquered death. Praise God, he has. One pastor this week said this. He said, for those of us who have truly seen the resurrection, even in the midst of pain and sorrow, we can still find Easter. That hope never leaves as we trust in our resurrected Savior. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, Admittedly, our worldviews are far more complex than what we could give 30, 35 minutes to. But I pray that, starting with myself and and for every single one of us, that that you would, first of all, open our eyes to the worldview we're truly clinging to. And Lord, I pray that we stubbornly fight against your worldview and against your hope. I pray that you will help us to see the beauty and wonder of your story of resurrection. Lord, for those of us who have so many different misgivings of of what the Christian faith holds, I pray that maybe you would just draw our minds and our hearts to the cross and the tomb. Lord, for the heart that is not called on you, do not let them go. Draw that heart to you. May that expulsive power of a greater affection, overwhelm whatever creation story they tell. And Lord, for those of us who constantly drift away from the glory and the beauty of the gospel, will you continually draw our hearts back? Lord, tackle us. Do not allow us to run from you. As we leave here and as we circle the tables for meals, as we hunt for Easter eggs, I pray that every single one of those Easter eggs will remind us of that new life and that new creation that is to come. Help us to be hounds for your grace and your mercy and your resurrection life in the world around us. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to conclude worship today by receiving the general offering. Let me just encourage you this. Many of you are visiting, and if you are visiting, do not feel uh, compelled to put anything in the basket as it passes you by. But, but for those of us who are a part of this church, let's respond to God's great generosity to us by giving back generously to Him. And let's continue to worship this morning. <laughs>
book of Hebrews was a letter written to a church that was struggling, struggling to believe, struggling to hold to the faith, struggling to hold to the cross and to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the author saw it fit to put this as the concluding benediction. And so I want to read this over you as you leave here this Easter Sunday. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing to to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Happy Easter. Thank <laughs> you.